That's good. To be Perfect. Again as well. Well done. Uh, I think it's just gone into the, the Lady Chapel to pray. Pray about the tech woes. Um. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to St. Andrew's Church. Lovely to see you this morning. Um, we've had a bit of an issue with our technology. We didn't think we were going to be able to get the words on the screen or the words onto YouTube or something, but it's all sorted, so that's really good news. Um, so thank you for the people at the back who have been making it all happen and fixing the issues and, uh, and those who've been praying as well. And as we were, as we were just praying, um, just in there, the groupers who are helping to lead the service this morning, um, just bearing in fact, bearing in mind, um, you know, the news at the moment and um, the horrors that we've seen in Turkey and Syria on that border of, of the earthquakes. And I, I was just thinking this week, really, as we were coming towards Sunday, of um, it's really hard, isn't it, to know what to say and how to respond to a tragedy of that scale, and. And just how important it is that as, as a church, one of the things we can do is we can gather together and we can pray. And, it's in, and I suppose from an outside thing, it kind of says, well, what's, what's that going to do? You know, they need money and, that's, and they need help, and that's true, and they do, and hopefully we can be generous in that sense. But the, I think there is that sense of, obviously, and we can pray on our own, but that sense of coming together, and even if the prayers don't have any words in them, just that thing of holding that nation and those people before God, collectively together, and, and grieving, I suppose, together, I think is really important. So as we come to our intercessions later in the service, of course, we will be praying for that situation and holding that before God. And, and you know, we're all carrying that in our hearts um, this week, I'm sure. So it's um, half term this week, so we don't ha have any um, Sunday club, unfortunately. unfortunately. I think we do have Pray and Play, who are, yet yeah, they're going to be in the, in the back um, so if you're a preschooler, then there's, there's provision, but there's no Sunday club, unfortunately, this morning. But we love to have everybody in together, so you're all very welcome to dance around. And we've already, I've already seen some people, Frey's been practicing with her flag, getting ready for the song, so I'm sure we'll have some flag waving and, and joining in, in in different ways this morning. A good morning to you also if you're joining us online. It's really good that you're able to be with us and uh, want you to know that you're part of our congregation here as well, even though you're not here physically. So as we start our service, uh, we're going to begin by singing uh, some songs. But before we do that, let me just open with a time of prayer. Lord God, we thank you that we can gather together uh, this morning as your people. And as we do that, we, we are mindful that we are gathering um, together here in this, in this space. But throughout the world today, there will be millions of Christians gathering in small numbers and big numbers, in... Um, in church that is under a tree, in church that is in a stadium, in church that is in um, a thousand year old building. And uh, we thank you that we're part of that church family. And as we come together, we, we, we know that we are your people. We know that we are loved by you. And we know, Lord, that your heart is for the world, that your heart is for those who are suffering. And our heart goes out to them too, Lord. And so as we focus on you, Lord, we pray that you would shape our hearts, that you would fill us with your heart of compassion, that you'd fill us with your heart of love. Lord, that you'd restore us in the places we're broken, that you'd heal us in the places where we're hurting. Lord, that we'd receive from you today all that we need. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and help us now as we lift our, our voices in song to praise you in spirit and in truth. Amen. Please stand.
the mountains shake and crumble at your name the oceans roar and tumble at your name the angels will bow the earth will rejoice the people cry out Lord of all the earth we shout your name shout your name filling up the sky with endless praise endless praise Yahweh Yahweh we love to shout your name oh Lord we'll go back to that first verse at your name, the mountains shake and crumble. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will bow. Earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Your name at your name the morning breaks in glory at your name creation sings your story at your name People cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Lord of all the earth. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O Lord. There is no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you. No one like our God, we will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you. Jesus is our Lord, we will sing. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies. With endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O Lord. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the sky with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh. We love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great
Savior go to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior go to thee. How great thou art. Sings my 
Amen. Please be seated. We come now to a time of confession. Let's just take a moment or two to be still. We come before the God who knows us fully and loves us fully. The God who longs to forgive us and to set us on a right path with him. No matter how far we feel we may have gone astray, he longs to welcome us back. In fact, he runs towards us with open arms, ready to receive us. So with this in mind, we say together our prayer of confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us, deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Beck is now going to bring this morning's Bible reading for us. Good morning. Um, so today's reading is taken from Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 44. <clears throat> The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you, Beck. Paul is going to come and uh, share with us on that passage, as he does 
um, I'm going to pray for him. Lord, we thank you for Paul. We thank you for his love for you. And we thank you for his wisdom and knowledge of your word. As he speaks to us this morning, Lord, help us to hear what it is you have to say to us. Through your Holy Spirit, speak through him and into our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Anybody here? Great. Are we having some PowerPoint? Thank you. When God promised to Moses that he was going to rescue the Israelite nation out of Egypt, he didn't provide him with all the details. Yet the the minute trivia was all there. It was implicit. It wasn't obvious. There was a lot of trust required by both Moses and by the people. Plagues growing in intensity until the Egyptian firstborn were taken. A route through the water for the Hebrews, but not for the Egyptians. Water from a rock, manna and quails from the sky, a route across the desert, even though it took 40 years. And at the end, a promised land. For the 5,000 plus men and women who were there on that day that we read about this morning, I wonder what they thought they were getting when they raced Jesus and the disciples across the top of Lake Galilee. So Jesus and his disciples would have been here, they came across to this rather quiet place there, and the people, they must have run rather quickly, ran round the outside of the lake. Did they know what teaching was on the agenda? I suspect not. Were they expecting healings and miracles? Yes, I think they probably were. Had they brought food for the day? Well, maybe not. The disciples had been out on mission. Chapter 6 and verse 12 and 13 tells us, they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. And then in the beginning of our reading today, the apostles gathered round Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. And then Jesus really wanted to take a little bit of feedback. He wanted to encourage them to see what had happened when they had gone out. So they got into the boat and they sailed over the other side of the lake to try and find somewhere quiet. The only snag was that the people found out and they went round the top and in fact they got there before the the boat landed. So when the, the disciples and Jesus landed, the people were already there waiting for Jesus. What a remarkable man Jesus was. But of course, I don't need to tell you that, do I? But we read, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion. Now, compassion is an action word. It's not like pity. Pity is sort of there, there. Compassion is we need to do something about it because it is with passion. And so Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He began to teach them. We don't have any details of of what he taught them in today's account. But the disciples became concerned about the practicalities of food. So we read on, on verse 35. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. As usual, 
Jesus' response was anything but predictable. You give them something to eat. This is as near as a promise as we get today in, in today's message. Because it's implicit that we, you, are going to feed them. The pack-ups have already been consumed, except for the boy who is mentioned in John's account. There was no corner shop nearby. The crowd was far from home. Yet Jesus put it in his normal straight manner. You give them something to eat. In verse 37, we, we read a little bit more about the, the disciples' concern. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? They were practical. They were worldly. Jesus strings him along. How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. He already knew what was going to happen. The five loaves and the two fish are produced. The people sit down in groups of 150. Can you imagine? 5,000 people. That's 72 rows of 70. It would fill that field out there. But Jesus takes the five loaves and the two fish. Can you imagine the reaction of the disciples? I think they might have looked in bewilderment at their mates when he broke them, gave them to them, and told them, go on, get on with the work. Notice five loaves broken into two equals 10, plus two fish equals 12. 12 disciples, off you go. They might have looked at the little bit of bread that they had and thought, is this for me? What about the other 4,999 people? Maybe Jesus gave them a shove out of the inner circle. Maybe he broke off a few little bits and said, like this, start giving them to the crowd. So they started. And they kept on giving and giving and giving and giving until everybody was satisfied, until everybody was filled to the brim. And there were 12 baskets of bits left over. You see, when God provides, he gives not just sufficient, not just plenty, but an abundance St. John adds this comment at the end of the miracle. He says, after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. A most wonderful miracle. And in that miracle, we see again the, the fourfold pattern that we've picked up throughout this series, right through the Bible. So first of all, God promises, this time implicitly through Jesus' words and his actions. Then the disciples are obedient, maybe a little reluctantly. And God provides. And then there are dramatic results. Hallelujah! I think there are two lessons that we can learn from this incredible miracle today. And the first thing is that God does provide. He provides plenty. In fact, he provides an abundance. You see, not only did Jesus feed 5,000 plus people, but there were 12 basketfuls of remnant, 12 basketfuls of bits left over. Because he is in the business of abundance. And it results in thanks and praise to the living God. I remember a story which uh, I had quite a long time ago about a Yorkshire, fam a Yorkshire farmer and his family. 
They were well known up the Dales for their generosity. They were always giving to other people who were in need. And somebody asked him one day, how can you afford to keep giving to other people? And he said, well, you see, it's like this, in his Yorkshire accent. He said, as fast as I shovel the grain out of the barns, God shovels it back in on the other end. God provides. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, speaks about worry. He says very simply, don't. Don't worry, but seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. They will be given to you as well. Over the years, Sheila and I and our family have been very privileged to be blessed by God's promises and his provision in many ways. I think probably one of the most dramatic was when we were setting out to work with Youth for Christ. We both had good jobs, we were paid a lot of money. We had a four bedroom detached house, we each had a car, and we knew that our salary was gonna be chopped. But we were given wonderful encouragement by the people who were praying with us and encouragement, in particular, from Philippians and chapter four. Next slide, please. And those words say, my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. My God will meet all your needs, not your wants, but your needs, according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So over a period of time, once we'd made the decision that we were going to give up our, our uh, normal jobs, um, we were provided with a house. Obviously, we paid for it, but it was a wonderful house. It was four stories high, and it, there was so much room in it for, for the, the young people to come in and out. It became a hub for young people in the area. At Christmas time, we were very concerned about the presents for our teenage daughters, but God provided, sometimes by money through the door, sometimes by presents, God provided. And then the icing on the cake, when we did all our sums, we had enough money left to buy a car. So we bought a Ford Sierra estate, which could take all of the gear for Youth for Christ, and it had 14 miles on the clock. So an almost brand new car. That uh, Christmas time, two months after we started, I went for Christmas lunch with my uh, mates that I'd wait, worked with in the CGB, and we had a lovely dinner together and a good long chat. And when we came out, I was opening the car of my door, and one of them said, who do you work for now? And I said, God. He provided, and he certainly has provided for us. Now, you may be saying, what about the people who don't have enough to eat? Those who can't afford to put their heating on. Not to mention those traumatized by the earthquake in Turkey and in Syria. Or terrorized by the war in Ukraine. And what about the fact that 1% of the wealthiest people in the world have 50% of the world's riches. A second le lesson from this reading, don't solve any of those issues, but it does relate to them. If you remember the source of the food for the 5,000 plus people was a boy's pack up. I don't know why he hadn't eaten what his mom had provided, Maybe she'd packed enough for lunch and for tea. But whatever the reason, he had five loaves and he had two fish, which he gave to the disciples and they passed on to Jesus and he somehow managed to multiply them in their hands. Of course, Jesus used what he was given and he multiplied it. This is happening in Starbeck and in Harrogate, right around the region, 
In fact, it's happening throughout Britain and in many other countries as caring individuals are giving money, are giving provisions to food banks, to community cafes like the food bank over the road and like resurrected bites serving in Knaresborough and several sites in Harrogate. To these donations are being added food and provisions from the supermarkets and from the local businesses to provide for those in need. If you want to know more about that, talk to Polly or talk to Phil. Christian charities like Christians Against Poverty and Care and others are using our donations and their expert trained workers like Sam and Haley. They're here somewhere? Oh, yeah. To overcome debt, to overcome poverty. Tear Fund and other charities will channel our donations, no matter how small our donations, to the places where relief is most needed at the moment to Turkey and to Syria. So that our small gifts become millions of pounds and lorry loads of aid, helping those in need. Last week's request from Tear Fund had these words at the end. Poverty is not God's plan. You are. Is that right? Poverty is not God's plan, but you are. So we need to be praying specifically into these situations. And we need to take God's compassion into the local situation. The old lady around the corner who is in need. The immigrant family across the road. The single man who's got four children and is struggling. The man at work suffering from depression and so many more. I challenge every one of us to be looking out for people who are in need. In need of our gift of love, given from the Father of lights to you and to me to share with other people as we see their needs. Because we are his ordinary people, yes, his extraordinary people, who he wants to use to minister to other people's needs in the power of the Holy Spirit, with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the glory of the Father. Amen. got a, a new song for you today which I hope you will see why it feels appropriate um, for particularly what Paul's been sharing but particularly the series we've had on God's promises um, please do feel free to sit to reflect to join in however you feel is appropriate for you Great is your faith. 
have our prayers now um, and I've got some pictures. Um, I, I was just thinking uh, after Paul was talking about the fact that you know he and Sheila were provided for and there's so many questions we have about a lot of things but I remember a missionary that we met in Cyprus who was around in the time of the earthquake in Izmit some years back in Turkey and she said that there was an occasion where they prayed and the Lord actually moved a huge column of concrete and there were, you know, people were able to get that person out. And, you know, God is at work, but we don't always see, do we, the full picture. So with that in mind, let's come to our prayers. Father, thank you for the signs of spring and the hope of resurrection that you give us in a world so full of destruction. We bring to you the people of Turkey and Syria, all who have lost loved ones and homes in the devastating earthquakes this week. We pray for all first responders and aid workers, and especially in Syria, where it is harder to get to people. And we pray for all who have been injured. We thank you for Max and Lyra, Paula's relatives, who are near Hate, which is one of the affected towns. Max has made it safely there yesterday with supplies for some of the people. We ask for your protection and your strength for him and others who are helping. We continue to pray for Joe and Paula as they raise finances to help those in need. And we thank you that Paula's ankle is healing. We continue to lift to you the people of Ukraine, and especially those still left in Bakhmut, where there's heavy fighting. And for all who are anxious about another offensive from Russia. Thank you for President Zelensky's visit this week to the UK and the European Union. As we look at King Charles receiving him, we continue prayers for Charles and the approaching coronation. We pray that you will become as central to his life as you were to his mother. We pray for our government, especially remembering those who've taken up new posts this week in the reshuffle. We ask that you will give them wisdom to govern well. And we remember our archbishops and bishops and pray about the recent decisions that Synod has made, which have concerned a lot of people. We pray for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the recent visit of Justin Welby and the Pope to South Sudan. We pray also for a lasting impact in DRC from the Pope's visit there. We ask that you will intervene in the fighting with the M23, which has displaced so many people from their homes. We also ask for your mercy on your people in Israel and the West Bank and Gaza as conflict continues there. And in Chile, we pray for your help for those suffering for the, from the current fires. In India, we continue to uphold Janaki and her team thanking you for the hundredth church that they have planted and the building that they've been given. We pray for the provision of a playground for her school. Thank you for the prices work in Brussels. And especially, we pray for Adrian and Fiona's worship ministry and the production of their latest CD. We praise you that Sam has been able to travel with Martin this week and we ask for your blessing on him as he has left now today for the Netherlands for preparations for the General Assembly, which will be held later this year. 
Martin is helping in the planning. We ask your blessing on him. Thank you for Neil and Joy and the Ministry of British Youth for Christ. We pray for him and his leadership team as they navigate changing structures and we ask you to continue to bless Grace's pregnancy. As we think of young people, we thank you for the recent youth event here in Harrogate. We ask your blessing on future gatherings and those from all the churches who are able to go and for the ones who are organising these events. We bring to you the Nobbs family and their YWAM team of young people in Durban. We pray especially for the next discipleship training school. We ask your blessing on Sam and Haley and all that they do in their work with CAP. We pray for those who are struggling with rising costs of food and fuel and ask for your provision. We thank you for our NHS and pray for those who need more pay. We remember those in our fellowship at this time who are ill or waiting treatment or surgery. Thank you for your presence at David Hill's funeral this week and for his part in the body of St Andrews. And we pray for Janet Cheeseborough and all who mourn for David. Please comfort them. We lift to you those who lead in our church and we pray for them and the PCC. Finally, Father, we pray for our community and ask that we might all be faithful witnesses to your gospel in the places that are our front lines. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Tina. So we're going to sing um, our final song together now. As we do, I think the collection will be taken. Um, thank you. If you're with us here in person would, and are able to, would you like to stand and we'll sing together.
Death could not hold you. Death could not hold you. Veils all before you. Silence the post of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever our God reigns. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name. Nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. So to our final blessing. May you know the God whose promise is to provide all that you need in and through Christ Jesus. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. So let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Here we go.